advice and opinions expressed by Dr. Grant Pichet and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grant Pichet. Dr. Grant Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask the questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning. We're trying a second time. This is take, take two. two. <laughs> and, uh, sometimes the internet does that test. But we're here. We're live. Fingers crossed. I'm Shannon Penrod. I'm here with Dr. Doreen Grampiche, a true expert in the Good field morning. of autism. Good, Good morning. morning. We're live right now on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And we look forward to hearing your comments. Uh, as you know, if you watch the show, Dr. Grampiche is a true expert in the field of autism. And we had a show last week mm -hmm. where we were talking about diagnosis and there was sort of a firestorm of people with questions we didn't get to everybody's question we decided to continue that topic today think right, of this as right. not only take two but part two yeah uh, talking about diagnosis we'll take absolutely any questions at all I do want to say that we're live right now I, I don't want to jinx us because I said this last time yeah. and all what but we were live on and we are live right now on Facebook YouTube and Twitter uh, and the show and our wonderful Chris Desmond is showing you all the places where the show can be watched. Don't forget that it is a podcast as well. It's its own podcast now. Mm -hmm. Ask Dr. Doreen. Make sure that you subscribe to that so that other people can find it. We were just saying to you that if you like this show and you like what you find here, we hope that you will share it with other people. There are, I know, for those of us who know, it seems unbelievable that anybody could not know <laughs> about Dr. Grampiche and what she's been doing here for over a decade, answering people's questions. But the rude truth is that there are people all over the world who probably could use this as a resource right. that don't know. Right. And it's free to them. Right. Um, uh, I was talking to somebody on Saturday, and they said, "What do you do?" And I was sort of describing it, and 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 I I guess you know I get zealous about it, and then I went, "But by the way, it's free." And she went, "Oh my God, I thought you were going to ask me for like a thousand dollars," and and I said, "What? No, this is free to all of the people that you know. It's a free." And she was like, "Oh, the, like you know, it sounded so great in my mind. I was like, oh, well, now it's five hundred. Now it's a thousand dollars." So it's free. It's a free resource. We're, yeah. you know, we're not trying to get into your wallet at all. Um, and speaking of which, by the way, you, you can be listening and podcast. And the way that we keep the lights on, uh, and I say that, we're, you know, we, we need more of this. I yeah. will say that. But uh, we do have some sponsors who sponsor the podcast. And so when you download the podcast, it's a free download to you, but there will be advertisements. And we hope that you embrace that like you do with all your other podcasts, because that makes it possible for us to be here. The only time that we ask for money out of your pocket is if you'd like to get that without the ads. If you're somebody who's like, listen, I can afford $5 a month and I'm willing to, to pay that to get it without the ads, please feel free to do that. You can go to glow.fm slash autism live. Here's the good news about that. If you do that, you get both the automatically the podcast for autism live and ask Dr. Doreen. Otherwise, they're separate and you need to subscribe to them separately and download them separately. Mm -hmm. Have I said it all? Did I leave yes, anything no, out? Yes, that's all good. How yeah. are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm wonderful now that we're here. Lucy is with us. Uh, she says, thank you for all your valuable information. And she's reminding me, and I actually have it here too. Um, we're asking everybody to go to copaa.org. And there are a lot of uh, wonderful references there. Uh, that's the Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates. Yes. So if you're looking for somebody to help you with your IEP, that's usually where we tell you to start. But they also have a big push right now to talk to your representatives about education because it's under fire. You know, yeah. IDEA has never been fully funded. Uh, you know, I know everybody wants to stay away from political. No, neither party has fully funded it, y'all. So. Um, but there's an opportunity right now, and we want to tell all of our representatives to prioritize students with disability in their appropriations for education in the 2024 uh, fiscal year. There are also places, and it, they make it so easy. Let me just say this. I did it the other day. You go in, you put your zip code in, 
and they tell you who your representatives are. They have a form letter that you can customize or leave it the same. You push a button and they automatically e email it to your representatives. I already heard back from one of my representatives. That's amazing. And said, thank you for you know, telling me that this is important to you. So it's super easy. Go to copaa.org. They also have stuff that they're doing about fully funding IDEA, yeah. which is very important to me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure it's very important to you and to a lot of people there because... You can say that you want to do the right thing, but if you can't fund it, it yeah. always becomes a battle and it always ends up costing our kids. So thank you, Lucy, for telling us that. We have Amanda with her blue hearts in the house. Um, yes, and Lucy says, let's encourage as many individuals as possible to tell Congress to fully fund IDEA. I, I do need to make a phone call to the White House. I just feel that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? Mm -hmm. um, because I've been talking to Joe here, and I, it seems that Joe is not listening. Maybe I'll call Jill, <laughs> Dr. Jill, and say, uh, do you know I got a Christmas card from them this year? Did you? I got one last year, too. It was very exciting for me. <laughs> um, I, I love getting a Christmas card from the White House, but I feel like, you know, I have not gotten the attention of, we need to, f you said you would. Yeah. Come on now. Anyway, said we weren't going to get political. Okay. Um, good morning, though. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> and I just want to recap. Last week we talked about diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You gave a wonderful explanation of what goes into the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you talked about was that if you take your child to get a diagnosis, you should get two numbers mm -hmm. and that people are not right getting two numbers in some some cases they're getting one number mm -hmm. and then at the end of the show we heard from our good friend Joanny who said I didn't get any numbers yeah she heard you say on the show go back and ask them for the numbers she went back and we didn't really get a chance to talk about this on the show but she said we just got an evaluation done last summer the doctor didn't give us numbers I specifically asked about it and she said this tells you everything you need to know about your kids so you don't need those numbers and we just saw that at the end of the show yes uh, last week so I kind of wanted to go over that because it made the top of my head come off and fly around the room a little bit yeah what a shame I uh, I'm not sure I mean so like I, it would be understandable if the person saying that is a pediatrician because perhaps they're not really trained in diagnosis you know pediatricians mm -hmm. are so busy nowadays with just medical treatment and they really are very controlled, I think, by their funding sources in the sense that I mean, I, we all notice that pediatricians come in and see you for 15 minutes, and that's about the only time they have. Um, so, but, you know, they really should be more aware of, of the diagnostic um, codes and how you properly diagnose. I think the severity, the two numbers have to do with severity in each of the domains, and I think it's really important, Shannon, because um, you know, as you know, there are a lot of parents of more severely affected individuals who even feel that this is a different thing and they should be separated yes. and they should have their own diagnosis. Yes. And, and I feel like the severity numbers allow us to really understand, I mean, the severity numbers are actually based on the amount of support the individual needs. I mean, and what's more important than that? Yeah. Right? So I think it's extremely important and as I said on our show last time, um, it matters where, the, so where you need support. So in some cases, you will need more support in the area of social communication. In some areas, the severity of, of the syndrome hits you more on the repetitive behavior. So, and that's a very different individual, someone who's struggling with social communication as opposed to someone who's really struggling with stereotypical behaviors so it's I think it's very important yeah I think the other part of it for me that I think really got me hepped up is that it feels a little bit like gaslighting mm -hmm. and one of the things that I see a lot uh, look we we have experts here on the show we we love to have experts you're my ultimate expert right and it's great to talk to experts and hear what they have to say. But sometimes people are so busy acting like an expert that they say they belittle you mm -hmm. instead of answering your question. And I think that that is a massive red I flag. I hate that, yeah. I hate that. I hate that. It, it feels a little like, you know, for them to say to you, well, you don't really need to worry about those numbers, feels like they're patting you on the head and saying, little lady. Yeah, this is all you need to know. <laughs> yeah. 
And, yeah. and if you're really in it to win it um, and to help your child, which I think any parent who gets yes. a diagnosis, immediately the thing, you know, everybody talks about the anxiety of it. The, the anxiety is, am I going to be up to this? Yeah. Am I going to be able to find the answers? Am I going to be able to figure this and out? And what's my path? And what I mean, is my path? I think that's the first question that parents ask me is like, what do I do now? Yes. And nobody really is assisting on that front. It's, I always, I, I'm shocked, right? Like autism is one of those things. You, your child has any other disorder or diagnosis, there's a specialist who will tell you exactly what you're supposed to do. Yes. And here with autism, there are so many different paths and, and it matters significantly what your child, your specific child needs. So that's why I'm like shocked that someone would say, you know, what it tells me, Shannon, is they just are kind of telling you it's autism, it's lifelong, there's nothing much you can do about it. That's the kind of attitude Which that we crap. used to have like 20 years, 30 yeah. years ago, 40 years ago. Remember where someone would say something like that? And um, if you remember, you know, our dear friend Bryce was mm -hmm. telling me the other day, obviously she has, um, she, uh, when her son was diagnosed at UCLA, she recorded the mm. session where they specifically told her you know, this is lifelong, save your money yeah, because you're going to need it. And then later after he lost his diagnosis, she went back and, and saw that same professional yeah. and played the recording. <laughs> so that's like awesome. You and know? I met that person oh, uh, recently at a thing and it was the first time that I met that oh, person. Oh, really? And, and uh, you know, they were like, oh, have you met? And I read and I, and I went, oh, and then, and, and then <laughs> she was like, oh, that was a re like, I, I don't know how to dissemble. You know yeah. me. And I went, oh, and we aren't going to say who it is. Uh, and, and she said, oh, you know, have we have met before? And I said, no, but I certainly have heard about you before. And she yeah. was like, really? And she thought it was a compliment. Yeah. And I, but I, I, I th it was like being burned. Yeah. Um, but because a lot of people look up to that. Well, she was extremely well known. I mean, and then People look up days, to her still. She, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, yes. But can I tell you that I just realized that this last week was the 18th anniversary of me having that meeting wow. with my person, and um, wow. and what she said to me when because she said yeah she had a German accent and she said yeah autism, and I said okay well what do I do now and her response to me was take him home and enjoy him yeah and was, I had was bite it, marks was it regional center by any way it by was Kaiser. Time? Oh, it was Kaiser. Kaiser. And then we had to wait for the regional center. Yeah. And yeah. that was a male person. But it was Kaiser. <sighs> Take him home and enjoy him. And I had bite marks up and down my arm. And, of course, you, you internalize everything. And I thought, oh, I must be doing it wrong because I'm not enjoying being, being bit. Mm. You know? Yeah. That, was my, that was what I was taking away in the moment. Good Lord. And I said, should I do ABA? And she said, oh, promise me you won't. Not with oh this gosh. baby. Oh my He's gosh. such a happy little guy don't do that and that was why i waited six months to be talked into aba after i met crystal and peter Sh peter shepherd and oh Matt my Logan. goodness thank god oh my goodness thank god right yeah because yeah. a, a chill goes up my spine yep. every time i think what if i had because i promised that woman i promise i won't do that um and and she had some pretty intense she said it would turn him into a robot yeah and that he would never understand what he was saying right I do want to go back and like smack her. I don't even know if she's around anymore. Uh, well, this is a different person, different oh. from Bryce's person. Yeah, I but know, no, but that's what I'm but saying. But my person, I don't think she's around because that was the first day of her retirement. She had uh, come in in retirement and so she said, you should be very grateful because I, I've worked in this field for 50 years and on my first day, oh. I would have told you that we needed to institutionalize your child and say goodbye to him right now. Oh my God. And I said, this baby? And she goes, yeah, that's 50 years ago. That's what we would have told you to do. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh yeah. Traumatizing. God. Let me say, yeah. So wow. diagnosis matters diagnosis and what matters. you get Severity told to matters. do. Mm -hmm. 
matters. Absolutely. If I had just listened to her. Yeah. So I, going back to, I think, you know, whenever you're talking to an expert, I, th I think that we need to put into our backpack some things that you need to be, if you're talking to an expert, the expert needs to listen to you. Mm -hmm. They need to know specifics about your child. Mm -hmm. And if they tell you, if you ask them something that's a real question, which what are the, you just diagnosed my child, what are the severity numbers? And they tell you, you know, that's not important. To me, that mm -hmm. is not an expert mm -hmm. you should be listening to. No, I agree. I, I agree. I think it's extremely important. And yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's the beginning of standing up for yourself and for your child, which will unfortunately be a journey you'll have to be on. Yeah. Uh, Amanda wrote in and said, Amanda, who's just, uh, you know, Amanda's last name is Bright, and I think that describes her. Yes, I love uh, that. She's so bright. Uh, she says, I'm amazed that I'm catching this particular ep episode. I just had a business idea to push resources to doctor's <sighs> office who are doing diagnosis. Many parents are just being sent off with a pat on the back and a good luck. Yeah. Um, it's And it's terrible. I do think um, there are some you know, insurance um, companies that um, have helped this along a little bit mm -hmm. um, because doctors will say, here's your provider for ABA. Mm -hmm. my, my issue with that is, is that sometimes that's the end of the conversation. Right. And what we see are parents arriving saying, I don't even know what this is. Yep. And, yeah. and that no one has mentally prepared them for anything. Right. So, and the doctor sometimes, well, I'm seeing more and more that the doctors don't write the prescription for what it should be. So that we have two and a half year olds show up with a 10 hour off, you know, yeah. prescription, which I do want to go back and slap that doctor into the middle of next week. Yeah. Um, because uh, what research is that based on? Oh, no. None. Um, but even then the parents are arriving and they think that 10 hours is a lot because no one has put it into any kind of context. Yeah. I, and I think it's good. I mean, it's something you, what you're saying, Shannon, I'd never really thought about, but mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. It's the uh, the same folks who say the severity numbers don't matter are the ones writing what's called the referral. And, you know, for us as ABA professionals, we do need a referral in order yeah. to uh, provide, get funding for children. Um, recently, I was kind of frustrated about this. Amanda will be happy to hear this. And I, uh, out of the CARD database, I pulled out, I think, the names of hundreds, if not thousands, of pediatricians who mm. are currently the pediatrician who referred our existing patients. Okay. So there's a very, very, very long list. I had one of our um, data scientists pull the list. And then we split it by zip code and which office is closest. Uh -huh. And then I had our OMs, our, our operations managers, we sent them flyers, the trifolds, if you remember, uh -huh. which one of them is what is ABA and okay. all that. Nice. And um, this is one of the things that OMs are doing this week, next week, is actually going to all of these local pediatricians, local to their site, and asking if they can leave the trifolds in their lobbies. Nice. Because I think pediatricians don't mind if they have yeah. so, a resource that they can refer to. Um, there's a lot of really good trifolds, if you remember, for yeah, parents. Yeah, great stuff. And it would be great if, like, if you have material, we should also have that done. Like, I just, and what we were just talking about before the show was, yes. I really am very passionate about getting information out. I feel like there was a wave years and years ago where there was, you know, you could get a lot of information from the Autism Society and Autism Speaks and yeah. research. I mean, like all these different places. And it's kind of like died down a little bit. It's almost like autism has become so mainstream. That everybody assumes. That everybody assumes there's enough awareness. And I'm out there, you're out there, we're seeing there isn't enough awareness. No, there isn't. No. Even of kids who are diagnosed. So, Amanda, this is breaking my heart. She said, also, my son was pushed out of ABA because he had no mal maladaptive behaviors. Mm -hmm. They said he keeps mastering all of his skills and instead of making new goals, they just discharged him. He was asked, he has asked to go back to ABA every oh. day since he was diagnosed. Yeah, well, I mean, the good news is, Amanda, that it sounds like he's uh, very, he's, he was doing really well. He was yes. mastering all his skills. Yeah. So that's And it sounds exciting. like that they were doing a good job because he wants to go back. So he yeah. was enjoying it. Yeah. But this is a problem with, with, I think parents understanding ABA, and I still wrangle with this sometimes. Right. This idea that with ABA, they're supposed to work themselves out of 
they always used to say at school the aides had to work themselves out of a job. Right. That that there is a line where kids are doing so well that they don't qualify for ABA services anymore, but it doesn't mean you're done. Yeah. And that and that sometimes we see them shoving kids out of the ABA nest right. earlier than they should be. Oh yeah, all the time. That How would you all combat that as a parent? I mean, so it's very difficult. I think okay, so I have a couple of thoughts about that actually. It's good that we're talking about this. Yeah. You know, um First of all, I'll say like one of the, as much as you know how my schedule is insane right now, yes, and how hard I'm working. I, I think the internal satisfaction that I get, despite working around the clock and being physically not really able to anymore work at that intensity, the the fat, the amazing motivation and uh, satisfaction that I get is from the fact that I can actually do something now again, right? Yes, I have some yes. resources and can actually make some change. Yeah. And so some of the stuff that I see right now is a lot has changed over the past five years that I was out of the field where um, ABA is, is being shoved into a corner by payers in the yeah. sense that it is being very much more kind of, uh, th there's this whole uh, and it's not just by payers, it's also by uh, new BCBAs coming out of college believing that intensive ABA should not be done, which is very shocking. But basically, it's coming to the point where people are starting to say, oh no, just, you know, you need just this much ABA and not what, you, what the child actually needs. And so, on the one hand, you combat it like as providers, and we have over 250 BCBAs, and they, of course, are... We're trying to teach them that you need to, uh, you know, know the literature. You need to have discussions with payers. You need to convince them that this child needs more hours, and that's always been part of my mission, uh, to not let the whole, you know, the payer relationship interfere with what's really necessary for each child. But on the other hand, also what's happening more, and I, I know that as parents we're all extremely busy, but I do truly, truly believe that uh, if parents were able to take advantage of the years where they do have some level of decent and intensive ABA and use that time to educate yourself, then you're not dependent as much on the payer system or on the provider. That's why like one of the things that I'm really working on and I want to talk to you about is yeah. um, just packages that are just for parents, right? Like yeah. uh, not not parent training in conjunction with ABA, but just, you know, pretty comprehensive parent training so that yeah. parents come out of it feeling, uh, and Stanford just recently has produced the program that is doing this, mm -hmm. right? And I'm thinking to myself, I it, when I was raising my kids, and I'm sure you'll feel the same way, mm -hmm the level of competence you have yourself understanding a behavior right and yeah. and when a when a behave, when a challenging behavior as amanda said like a maladaptive challenging behavior occurs and you think to yourself you immediately know what it is about like the, just the thought of when a challenging behavior occurs the first thing as an aba person the first thing you know is that my child is trying to communicate something this is a form of communication yes. as opposed to oh my God, my child is doing this horrible thing, how will I ever get rid of it, right? It's just, it, the more you know, the less fear you experience, and the more you, are, uh, you have a plan of action, and you take action, and things change faster, and that's good for your child, good for you. It is, so I think like parents' information and knowledge is just the only way to go, because everything, for instance, that pediatricians know, for example, is from parents going back and saying, no, the literature says I should have intensive. Please write 40 yes. hours. Yes. You know, it's always parents educating the field. So and this is something I feel very passionately about, too. Parent competence, I think, is at the core of everything. Absolutely. I think it's the answer to everything. It's the answer to all of the anxiety that we have. It's the answer to... Um, you know, getting the right services, it's the answer to finding your way to everything yes. is, is parent competence. I love that Amanda says regarding the trifold, yes, yes. that's what I want to do. Yes. But I thought instead of it coming from a provider, it could be coming from a parent's perspective like Shannon and myself. 
the way the opinion is felt unbiased when the parents are reading the information. My main focus was empowering parents about how to find quality ABA like card. Yes. And Amanda, you know, happy happy to work with you on a on a trifold. Let me just say that. Um, okay. Uh, Varsha has written in and said, what will be the strategy for non-verbal audience, how to pr um, improve communication? Which this is a part of, I think, when we empower parents, there's so much bad information out there, but we, when we empower parents to understand how to increase communication, um, I, when I have started now talking to parents, I was just at a meeting um, with parents on Thursday night and was talking, for so long I talked about intensity and you know the research and everything and all that's a part of the conversation, but you really have led me to start talking about what is the most important thing that you want mm. is to build communication. How long does it take to teach language? Yes. If yes. we are going to teach your child how to speak Russian, would we expect to do that in an hour a day? Right. And parents go, well, crap, no. Right. Then how long, how long should we make them available so that they learn how to communicate in the language that you're choosing? Right. And then it becomes very quick, oh, that's why you're asking for right. so many hours. Instead of, and then say yes, and the research shows, by the way, that's what's most effective. But so first of all, I want to say it takes a lot of hours mm -hmm. to teach communication. Right. Um, oh. So, but uh, based on that, what path forward do you say for teaching kids who are nonverbal? Okay, so it's a it's a really really important issue because if you, when a child, so you know like just starting out when you get your diagnosis, the majority of the children, as part of the diagnosis, obviously have difficulty with communication, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, right? Vocal or nonvocal, as we say. So, and if you cannot really communicate. The issue becomes that how are you going to have your needs met? How are you going to be able to express, if you're, let's say, very young, that you want something or that you don't want something? And as you get older, this, of course, becomes harder and harder, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so as a result of that, you typically, if you cannot communicate, anyone, this is not about children with autism, anyone. Yeah. If you cannot communicate with those around you, if you cannot express vocally or non-vocally in an in a appropriate manner, let's say, if you can't express your needs, um, then what happens is you find ways to get your needs met, and the ways are not necessarily socially appropriate, are not necessarily adaptive. That's where you start to develop challenging, what we call challenging or maladaptive behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. If I can't tell you that I need a break, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit you. If I can't express that I want that toy or I need juice, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab it and push you or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. it become, I'm just going to try and get it for myself because sure. that's human nature. So this is why it becomes really important to identify how the, pa the child can actually communicate or how can I teach the child to communicate. The first thing in, um, when we do have a, di you know, th all things, in, and I have to say things are different now, but when you, if you have the, I guess, privilege of diagnosing a child young, so yes. two to three, then you have the time before academics hits the child you have a couple of years where you can do a lot of work on language and communication, right? Mm -hmm. And very quickly, I would say within the first year, you will come to, maybe even within the first six months, you will come to realize if a child can vocalize or if there is, is a lot of apraxia and other aphasia and other issues that are preventing the child from vocalizing. Mm -hmm. And either way, you need to redirect yourself and teach the child how to communicate and that can yes. be of course you know thank you Andy Bondi many many years ago developed PECS yes. picture exchange communication system there's a sign of course a lot of kids still communicate through sign language um, and there is now with technology augmentative systems uh, as simple as the iPad right yes. or other systems where there are icons and you can press an icon and the, and the AUG device actually speaks for you. There's yeah. lots of ways you can learn to communicate, but communication 
is super important to, to reduce frustration. Yes. And I love that Amanda has said that the first thing is making sure that your provider assumes competence. Right. That, and I th thank you, Amanda, for saying that, because I think we all know that and assume that, so we forget to say it sometimes, that you know, just because, I love the poster, just because my child is nonverbal doesn't mean they don't have something to say. Right. They all have something to say. So let's, let's all be on that page. But then Alicia has written in and said, I wish that they would have given my son a communication device at diagnosis mm -hmm. instead at first grade uh, they want him to do the the PICS first. Pex. Well she said PICS but I assume that's PECS. Um, so PICS is really good uh, and some and I, I don't have the questions just battery okay. ran out so okay. just so you can yes. but uh, what I was going to say is PICS is not a bad thing. PICS is beautiful. It is some often uh, what we do even before we go to an ARG device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so every child is different, so don't regret it because PECS will help even once you go to keyboarding or ARG devices. So and it's just important to keep working on wherever you are and great if your child is that. And let me tell you, a lot of parents, I guess, reject the idea of non-vocal communication early on. I have a parent right now who I'm trying to convince because their child has already been in therapy outside of CARD. It's not a CARD patient, but it's someone else who has had, you know, what the parent thinks is very high quality therapy for many yeah. years. And the child maybe expresses 10 words, but only when the child, like, non not very consistently. Yeah. And so, and the child gets frustrated and has both self injurious, like she, the child bites themselves as well as aggressive types of behaviors, you could tell it's from frustration. Yeah. And it would be so important to teach this child, give this child some form of non-vocal communication. But the parents are against it because they, yeah. they fear that if they do that, the child might stop using those 10 or so words. And yeah. that's a common fear. Very common. And um, it, it can be easily uh, alleviate it, I guess, and if you just require the the vocal as well as the non-vocal. Yeah. And the research is in on this, by the way. Yes, yes. That the research absolutely. shows that if you, if, if a certain amount of time has passed and you're not getting to the spoken language, that if you switch and go to auxiliary, whether it's PECS or the other, that, and get functional communication, that you are more likely to get to spoken language yes. than if you didn't. Yes. And you're more likely to get to it quicker. And the, and the reason for that is that if you have a way to communicate your needs, whatever way it is, then you have a faster way of learning mm -hmm. and a faster way of communicating so that the challenging behaviors decrease and then you can really get into teaching. Right. As a former teacher, if I have to work on classroom maintenance to get everybody's behavior, in line before I teach, that takes teaching time. Yes. But if I can make it so that everybody, when I walk in, we're ready to learn, mm -hmm. then I get so much more done. Right. So that always made great sense to me. However, this whole idea of which one do you go first, because Alicia said they use Proloquo 2 Go, mm -hmm. which everybody um, agrees that that's a really good one. It's not the only one. It's one of the more expensive ones. And I will say that some of the people that we work with like a different one mm. that's a lot less expensive. Oh, interesting. So, Which one is the uh, other one? Of course, I can't think. Of I, I would have right to now? ask Sue Cho. Yeah. She always tells me every year and every April they have a discount on it where you get it for like 60% nice. off. It's nice. the only time during the year. I will find that out for you. Um, but um, sometimes I have seen people who want to start with the PECs first mm -hmm. because, and, and as Alicia says, their child is very much into the digital world, mm -hmm. um, that sometimes having it be on a card and exchanging it so that there's a physical thing first before it's pushing yes. a button yes. is advantageous because yes. the kids get into the iPad and then they start learning everything about the iPad Absolutely. and it makes them like this in the iPad or, yes. the, or the Dynavox or whatever the AUG device is. So I don't want to say that it's never, PEX is never a thing. You should always go for different things for different kids, right? Yeah, absolutely. But also they made a comment here about, you know, that we should have hope un until like five. Yes. And I want to put in there that we, we've seen kids mm -hmm. and especially I'm seeing that there's a group of, of young women 
who don't start speaking until they're teens. Yeah, that does happen. It, well, I don't know about teens, but there are, there, mm, there's a lot of, if we go down this path. Oh, <laughs> I, mean, I know, there's, I opened a kit Pandora's. No, just because there's other uh, control-related disorders okay. that come into play as well. Ah. Uh, and so, so, is that so yeah, I mean, elective mutism is one of them, okay. right? Where it is the individual is actually choosing not to speak. Okay. There's there's lots of other types of disorders that can also occur, but uh, yeah, but in general, I think that uh, you can tell pretty early on if a child has uh, the ability to develop some form of vocal, and if they do, and they consistently use it then you should go down that path. But using non-vocal devices doesn't necessarily delay. In fact, in a lot of cases, it, it helps the child go faster on the vocal it as well. It just starts it. I do want to, there's a journalist on here, and I, I want to make sure they can contact me separately because okay. they're asking questions that don't really have to do with the show. They want to talk about card stuff, and I'm happy to talk to them. Okay. Um, and I, I just don't want them to take our time here. Exactly, exactly, for our viewers. So I, I don't know. Uh, so uh, let me say this. Uh, this is uh, for Matthew that you wrote in. If you write directly to me, I will connect you to Dr. Graham P. Shea. Perfect. My yeah. email is Shannon at autism-live.com. How's that? But I don't want to take any more because this is time for parents to have their questions answered and for people on the spectrum to have their questions answered. But thank you. Thank you for... Yeah, uh, of course. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, Alicia says um, that... Um, I want to see... She School to, kept telling them yeah. he wasn't ready yeah. for a device. So she went and bought it herself. It was expensive, but he needed it. I figure, you know, sometimes insurance will cover that too. Check with your That's insurance. That's true. That is true, yes. To see if they will yes. cover that. Yes. Uh, I figured if he can find my phone and find YouTube and what he wants to watch, then he can use a device and we keep trying. Absolutely. And that's uh, it's, it's so funny that you write about that, Alicia. I remember that... Uh, in my earlier part of my career, when I was, you know, much younger, working with kids and just learning a lot about kids, right? I would say like 1990-ish, I remember. Yeah. I remember meeting a child in New York who, um, later we found out he actually had a lot of hearing issues, which was part of the reason that, and that's another reason, by the way, yes. that a child might have non, be non-vocal is their hearing, which is why we check hearing right away. But um, in any case, I remember with that child, it was just very obviously, because he couldn't hear us, it was very hard to teach him to vocalize. But he was, he was two years old. I remember this so well. You would be, and in those days, obviously, it was, you know, we're talking early 90s. Um, he, he knew at the age of two, maybe three, he knew how to go up to the TV, turn it on, turn yeah. on the VCR, you know, eject the VCR, like t the VHS, yes. take it out, put another one in, turn it on, and go back and say, and I was always like, wow, his technical side is extremely strong, you know? Yes. And I think that's really important, too, is when talking about diagnosis. Yeah. You know, diagnosis, by definition, pinpoints the stuff that your child struggles with. Yeah. But I think it's just as important to list the stuff that your child is good at yes because that becomes so much a part of your treatment plan and your uh the things that you use as reinforcers like yeah. there are so many children who have a diagnosis who are incredible with music yeah. beyond our capabilities there are so many children who are unbelievable with art right art yeah. is their way of communicating there are so many children who have uh, the ability, like uh, a memory that is just photographic and beyond words. There's so many talents that we need to also list and also make yes. sure we are aware of when we're listing. That's why when I teach RBCBAs or, you know, write the, our protocols, I always would say you have strengths, you have weaknesses, but you have strengths. Yes. And make sure you balance that out. Well, and that goes back to the question about how do you fight to continue ABA if you don't have maladaptive yeah. behaviors? Because I feel like a lot of people think that ABA is just there to address maladaptive right. behaviors. Right. But the other side of it is skill building. Absolutely. And you have to realize, remember, we just did the diagnosis. Did I mention anything 
about maladaptive behavior mm -hmm. as a symptom of autism. No, it is not a symptom of autism. This is really important. I'm glad you brought it up, Shannon, because a lot of people think that, you know, tantruming, uh, biting, running away, throwing, spitting, uh, all, any of those things that we call challenging behaviors are part of the symptoms of autism. And when you think that something is a symptom of, of a disorder that your child has, you're, very, you're much less likely to do anything about it because you just kind of think, oh, it's part of the plan. You know, it's just yes. something he has. What am I going to do about it? But it isn't. None of those things are part of the symptoms. They are a side effect. They're the result of one of the symptoms, which is not being able to communicate. So that's, I think, in its own very important. And ABA, yeah, does work on that. But the way that we work on challenging behavior is to replace it with adaptive behavior. Mm -hmm. So there is a very important component of skill teaching. Yes. And even if, the, even if it's true, like I, I find it as an ex-school teacher, I find it very hard to believe that there's a single, single child in any classroom, diagnosis or not, that is not having some maladaptive behaviors right. because I've taught. And I, you know, oh, right. And sure, it's sure, sure. It's a zoo, right? Right, right. So I, I find it very hard to believe that there isn't something to be worked on. But even if that were true, yeah. like you're telling me that the child who has the diagnosis has no area of deficit, that you wouldn't want the best possible teaching method right. employed to teach them. Right. So that's, a, that's an argument to have with the school. Um, uh, Amanda says it's never too late. I love that. Uh, she says, I left my Photoshop up and Microsoft Word up, and my son learned how to do things that day in it. I have never shown him how he just figured it out because we have to presume uh, that our kids are competent and they are more than competent often on, on the computer thing. I, you know, even when Jem was little and we first got our phones, I would hand my phone to him to, and I, we go to see a play and I'm like, show me how to put it on airplane again. Well, Jem is the one who introduced me to the world of VR. VR, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Crystal says, hello, my son is six, will be seven in September. He's currently in kindergarten at an autism academy. Mm -hmm. He gets 15 hours of ABA at home a week. He was diagnosed at 22 months old. He has been doing ABA for going on five years now. When should I know to separate my ways with ABA now that he will be in first grade in August? Feel kind of stuck. Sending you a hug, Crystal. What is her question again? She wants to know when do you know to fade ABA? Oh, to when fade. are you done with it? Because we brought this up earlier about yes. there comes a time and ABA is supposed to you know, intensive ABA is supposed to set you up so that then you go, I remember when Jem graduated, mm -hmm. I just had this question the other night, people wanted to know, when did you stop ABA, how did you feel about it? Mm -hmm. And the first two years I couldn't wait to be done with ABA and then I couldn't, I, did, I hoped it never went away mm -hmm. because it was great for us and yeah. it was great for him. But there came a time when Card said to us, he has learned enough that he now, and I said, he's not done. Mm -hmm. And Card said, no, but he needs the, to go do it completely in the real world now. Yeah. And you'll come back to us if there's something that you can't figure out, but he needs to go do that in the real world. Right. I wasn't ready. He was ready. Right. And Card was ready. Right. But how do you know? So uh, I love that question. I'm so glad somebody brought it up because it has, it, first of all, to answer your question and then like to go into my own philosophical issue with this. But okay, okay. The, the way you know is that your child is able to learn from their environment without any manipulation of the environment. Mm. That's the way to know. So, because ABA is just a manipulation of the environment. That's okay. what it is, right? It is, uh, we simplify instructions and we reward them highly. That's essentially how ABA differs. Yeah. Um, from, from just what you gain from your environment. So if your child is, uh, it doesn't matter if they have still, they're behind on certain skills. If they're learning from their teacher and peers, you're good to go. Like you can fade out. But if you still need some structured instruction because your child's not learning from other means, then you need it on an ongoing basis. It's yeah. very simple. It's like tutoring. Now the the thing that is really important about this that I think our viewers might appreciate is that just like anything else, like think of learning another language or learning a new, um, I don't know, craft or something like that. If you go in pretty intensively at first, yeah. then you will learn it and then it's, you've now accumulated this level of, so let's say language. 
if you do like <clears throat> a year of intensive work, then after that year, you can do much, much, much less. Yeah. But if you don't do that intensity in the beginning, then what you have is a lot of material that has to be spread out over a longer period of time, yeah. if that makes sense. And that's what is happening more and more. Yeah. And that's the problem because, yeah. uh, you know, it's one thing to say, so children, when we get children early and we start to work with them intensively, the hope is that by the time they're hitting school age, so five, six, even seven in some places, we are able to reduce the ABA and allow the child to adjust to the school environment and learn more from their teacher and peers and so on. And so then now the ABA becomes supportive of what else is going on as opposed to leading the charge. Yeah. And then gradually the ABA is just faded out and it kind of like, you know, then it could even linger for years based on the child's needs, but at a very low dosage, right? right? But what happens now is that unfortunately there's so much misunderstanding about ABA, there's misinformation, there's also pressure from payers. And so what happens is in those early years where we have the ability to do intensity, uh, nobody's doing intensity. Yeah. So all of so then it becomes more lifelong to be honest yeah. because we never took the uh, opportunity to really teach the child let's say language or social mm -hmm. behavior or whatever and now a whole bunch of other stuff has compounded now we also have academics on top of that mm -hmm. now you know it just becomes harder and harder because there's just so much more to teach as the child ages. So this is, these are some of the issues. I also think it circles the drain for frustration for kids. And I, the absolutely, example I absolutely. Use, the example I always use is when I have to do payroll, because yeah. I have to do payroll every two weeks. <laughs> and it's a computer thing, and I'm not that good with it, but I, I have to do it every two weeks. Yeah, so this is I, me and Excel charts. Right, and how often have we been doing it? For years, mm -hmm. right? But because I don't do it every day, I keep struggling with it. Whereas if you forced me to do it every day for two months, I would never have a problem with payroll again. Yeah. And I would never be frustrated because I would feel competent because I would know what I was doing. Yeah. Because you gave me more opportunities to right. learn and more immediate feedback, which is all ABA is, you guys. Opportunities and immediate feedback. Right. Um, but because I, I only have to do it once every two weeks, I then have to go bother I people and I'm way. frustrated. I, I feel so the same way. So why would we do that to kids? Uh, exactly. It makes exactly. no sense. And also, like, it's a great example you give, by the way, because like, I have this frustration with like, use of Excel, right? So I have a basic ability and understanding to, to yeah. use Excel, but I can't build like tables and, and formulas and, formulas and stuff oh, like that. Yeah. And, it, it's funny because before I retired, I would like in, you know, five years before I retired, I used to tell myself, I got to take an Excel course. I right. got to take an Excel course. Right. I kept telling myself that. And then I retired and I was like, I'm never going to use Excel again. Right. And here I am now again <laughs> in that are. same boat. I was yeah. telling my son the other day, I was like, didn't you have like a little um, notebook that you got from high school that was all about how to use Excel? Where is that thing? Do you still have it? And he was like, just go online. We don't use books anymore. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, I will yes, do there's a video somewhere to explain it to you. Uh, Varsha's given us a little bit more information, sending her a hug. She says, I'm Varsha. I am facing challenges while running an inclusive school in Patna, Bihar. Mm. I don't even know where that is. Can you please give me a, a clue as to where that is? I'm geographically challenged. Mm -hmm. Where I educate special children. One of the difficulties I encounter is that parents believe that their children will miraculously improve once they start attending school. But despite everyone's hard work, the progress is not as quick. It is known that these children cannot improve rapidly and they are leaving school. What could be a strategy to make them understand? It's in India. Wonderful. Yeah. <sighs> and I mentioned at the beginning that I am now explaining it to people saying, you know, how, how many hours, if, if you contracted with me to help your child to learn a language that they don't know, how many hours would you expect that to take? Yeah. I don't know why we sort of understand that. Yeah. Because we, we all know what it takes to learn another language and that it's not something you learn overnight. No, I mean, for some kids it is, and for other kids it's not. Like this really goes back to the individualization of skills mm -hmm. and capabilities. Mm -hmm. And so to answer this question, I would say 
If you are responsible for a group of children, it would really benefit you to go on, uh, get a license to Skills. Yeah. The whole re Skills is the platform, the curriculum that we built for CARD. And the reason, if you really want to think about it, that what we did, uh, which was very important, I think, is that we produced a um, assessment. And I think that's what would benefit you because the assessment is not, it's, you know, so first it started out with like, I really want to get to know every single child. They're so different from each other. And I want to figure out what this child's needs are. What are these child's strengths and weaknesses in all the different areas of functioning, right? Skills is, starts with an assessment and it asks you questions in language, play, cognitive, executive functions, uh, academic, motor, social, I mean, you name it, it's everything that you would ever need, right? Every behavior. And then once you've established this kind of uh, yes, no, yes, no, my child can do this, and you have a picture of the child, what skills gives you is a standardized kind of baseline to compare it to, which we did over many years. We, pre we validated it. And that's really, really important because w what that is is essentially all the different, like your child does this at this chronological age, this is what they should be doing. So if these are the things that a child of your age should be doing and your child is here, we have to teach these things. And that's, I think, what would be very useful to you um, if you're seeing multiple children because the most important thing with autism is it's very individualized. Whatever you teach is individualized, Te not just in terms of content that you're teaching, but also in terms of how the child learns. We were just talking about yes. this. Some children are visual, auditory. They need more reinforcers, less. The timing is different for each child, all that sort of stuff. But um, you know, there are some children who learn pretty rapidly, let's face it. And then I, I took a child from like being non-vocal to completely finishing and being mainstreamed. That was the shortest I've ever done in about 18 months. Yeah. And so it's kind of like that it can happen. And then you can also go with a child for 10 years. But you it didn't do that in 10 matter. hours a week. Let's no, be clear no, about that. that. Was a that, very was inten intensive. that was massively intense. Yeah. 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 Um, because that's a part of it too. Yes. But that all yes. goes back to where we started this hour, which is about those two numbers. That, you know, if you, yes. just, if yes. you just think about if somebody has a three for rep repetitive restrictive, mm -hmm. that means that they need intensive support and that they are often stuck in these restrictive behaviors exactly. and that they, that, they are ha that they really have a hard time breaking out of that. Yes. And if they had a one for communication, it would mean that they still need support for communication, but they're pretty ver mobile and vocal. Correct. Ver verbal, verbal and, and vocal. vocal. That's what I want to say. And I've met people that are a one, three in that direction. Correct. And they are people who can, they have a lot of words coming out of their mouth, but they often have so much anxiety yeah. that they aren't able to hear things coming right, back. Right. So how you would teach someone who is a one, three in that direction, the multiplication table would be vastly different than if you were teaching somebody who had the reverse, three, who had one. almost no language Correct. and was a three for communication, but, but had, had almost, very, very little self-censored. That's right. And exactly. how you would teach those two people right. the multiplication table and how, like how you That's would right. start and how you would, you know, reinforce them everything, and make it fun for them. It would, would be, be completely different. different. Everything is different. Exactly. So to say that the numbers don't matter right. is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Right. <laughs> and there. All there, right. We brought it all the way home. There we brought you go. it all the way back. Okay. So uh, which think... they want to know which tool do you use for assessment? And we can answer that quickly because we've gone over time. I know, but we started late. That's why, yeah. I, that's why, <laughs> okay. that's why I was letting that um, go. But. For assessment, so, and they're asking about skills. It that's was the same person question. asking about skills, Okay, yes. so we designed our, uh, our own assessment and validated it as part of skills. Go online and look at skillsforautism.com. Yes, Skills exactly. for autism. There you go. Um, and it's a much, much, much bigger than most tools. So it's age-based, it's normed, it's validated against uh, other standardized tests. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, it's a developmental assessment. It's really good. And I always say, tell them that we sent you. 
um, you know, so that they know how you heard about it. Uh, I, I do want to say, Amanda said, we need social skills resources for teens in Texas. I hate living here and can't wait to move. We have zero facilitated social programs here in Houston mm. um, because she's talking about a 15-year-old, and that's part of the reason why ABA said uh, no, because they want to work on social skills. And, and I, I do want to say that, uh, yes, we need more things, but there are some things and that you and I should talk about some things that you might find in Texas. Um, but and I who, always... Who was that? Was that... That's uh, Amanda. Is oh, saying I she's didn't a know 15 she's in Texas. Old, yeah, she's in Texas. And, um, but she should move here. We all have decided that. Well, we also have a location in Houston, and it would be kind of an interesting idea to work together to develop some social skills. There you go, Amanda. There we have it. Um, but also want to say that a lot of us have found, and there's more and more research coming out about putting those kids in a drama program. Oh, yeah. That will allow yeah. inclusion. If you're looking for social skills and you don't have anything for teenagers, that's the next direction to go in. Mm -hmm. um, and if you and if they don't have a drama program, ask the local community theater. Sometimes you'll find amazing people there. Right, right. All right, now we have to end the show. But thank you guys so much. Uh, again, if you need to reach out to me, Shannon at autism-live.com. Oh, I have a huge announcement about tomorrow. I can't believe we didn't get to this beforehand. We're having Temple Grandin on the show tomorrow. But we had a little bit of a kerfuffle in terms of time zones. Yeah. And so we are going to be live with Temple Grandin at 8.30 Pacific time tomorrow. So it's a whole, what is that, an hour and a half earlier than we normally are. If you want to ask questions of Temple, please send them to me now. And if you want to watch her live, that's going to be at 8.30 Pacific time tomorrow, hour and a half earlier than we normally do. It will re-air at 10, but if you want to be there with me, with her live, Dr. Temple Grandin, at 8.30 tomorrow, a, a, a time that we not aren't normally live here, but we do that for her. All right. Uh, that'll be a good, good show. We're going to talk about jobs and identity. I love and, that. So it's going to be good. But she'll also answer your questions. I, I just prefer it if you send the questions in early because there are some questions that she does not like to answer. Um, so, oh, and Amanda's got 20 parents for you, so there you go. You're, oh, that's amazing, Amanda. Yeah. We really should, uh, please, we should yeah, really let's talk. Connect. We should really let's talk. Connect. It's all good. Uh, she's part of the family, so we're all Yeah, good. exactly. <laughs> all right, you guys. Thank you so much for sticking with us through uh, an our early internet issue. And thanks to Chris Desmond for getting us live and keeping us live. You're a miracle worker. We adore you. Uh, <laughs> I don't, don't be in any doubt he about laughs. that. He I doesn't know. realize how much we appreciate oh him all gosh. the time. Oh, my gosh. We, you know, <laughs> we, we, we call him the Ted Lasso of, of, of right. the Autism Network now <laughs> because he is like Mr. Positivity <laughs> and true. and like just amazing so anyway uh thank you guys all for being here don't miss tomorrow's great show with dr temple grandin and uh until then thank you oh such a pleasure shannon you good to be are here with amazing you. thank you uh and but we'll see you guys tomorrow until then give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too bye bye for now bye everyone Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.